Let's pray. These people are very precious, Father, and I thank you for each one of them. I thank you for their family. I thank you that you are with them wherever they are at in their life, whether they're having a very blessed time or they're struggling through something. Be with the people on Zoom. It, it is absolutely amazing to me that these people would hone in on this presentation instead of watching Gunsmoke Lord. So I just ask that you bless everybody in this presentation in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to talk in the first hour, I'm going to talk about family relationships and strongholds that are related to it. Uh, Please be ready for some uh, questions that you want to ask me. And then the second, the second hour, I'm going to talk some about um, the gifts of discernment and knowledge and the use of them in uh, spiritual warfare. And I'm going to talk about the process of discipleship and why it's important after you lead someone through uh, deliverance, okay? That's, those are the two things we'll talk about in the second half. And we need we need a lot of questions uh, on both, both, both issues. When was marriage instituted? Anybody just tell me, when was it? In the garden by who? So no government is in charge of the marriage institution, right? Correct. So anything related to the education of marriage and married relationships that is not of God should really be ignored. Correct? No, you're not sure. Who is the one who sanctifies a man and woman at the altar of marriage in the covenant that is created between God, man, and woman? God does. He wants, he wants that marriage relationship to be filled with his truth and his authority so that there could be an atmosphere that the man and woman to begin with has every opportunity to become what Jesus Christ would want them to become. Okay. And then when the children come along, they, uh, they will live in that atmosphere and grow and mature in Jesus Christ. That's, that's the intent of God through marriage. <coughs> Our marriage as the world views it, not only in America, but all over the, the world, is completely different than that, except amongst people who love Christ and follow the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything was fine until guess what happened? Chapter 3. Mm -hmm. Then there was deception, and man and woman fell. And the marriage relationship began to disintegrate. And it has been disintegrating throughout 6,000 plus years. There have been periods of revival where marriage has been reinstituted and re-enjoyed by people, but it has continually been eroded away to the point where 52% at the last I check 50%, 52% of the people you go to church with, and it may even be some of you, 52% get a divorce. In divorce, there's pain. There's hurt. If you want to see people have a healthy relationship, we've got to look at why there is division in divorce and pain in divorce and how we as born again Christians can begin to minister to it and direct people to healing wherever God might want that to happen. Okay. 
You, you understand? Okay. Um, Kathy did not draw this. I did. So when you see in a minute, you'll see what Kathy drew. And it's good. So this is, what is this? Dog, cat, the man. <laughs> Here, draw the woman. <laughs> can you see this? Is it dark enough you can see it on Zoom? Maybe turn it, turn it, yeah, turn, it turn it just a little bit this way. I don't know. Yeah. There you go. Is that is that good? Yep. Can you see it, Sam? Yes, we can see it. It's good. Yeah, I can yeah. see it. Okay. <laughs> when two people meet each other and they quote unquote fall in love and they make a decision to get married, there is there is an emotional relationships going on between them and both people feel it. If you did not both feel it, you would not have married that person. You wouldn't. You're not married, so remember that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> if she don't feel nothing, don't marry her. <laughs> if you're not submitting to God, don't marry her. <laughs> 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 well, I have money. Well, I have money. All right. So, so this relationship goes on. Now, this man right here has a past. I don't care what kind of past he has, whether it's good or bad. Okay? He has a past. Here's this woman, and she has a past. You got it? Do you think those two people who came from two backgrounds that are totally different, that have totally different past, are going to hit it off after marriage? Mm -hmm. Well, it's going to be perfect. That's what you mean by hit it off. <laughs> <laughs> In West Virginia translation, that means like each other. <laughs> Did you know that you both have two theologies? Did you know that? Even if you're both born again, you have two different theologies. <laughs> no, it's because you have two different families. If these two came from the same families, you'd have similar, if not exact, theology. Okay, you'd have a weird map. West Virginia. <laughs> I didn't want to say it. <laughs> you know what? The atmosphere in here is better. Yeah. Okay. And we have a newlywed in the back. Where? <laughs> Hey, close, close attention. <laughs> okay, so theology is different. Family traditions are different. Okay, that's tradition. <laughs> okay, help me out. Educational background is different. Political. You know, my wife and I both are Republicans and conservatives. And we both voted for Trump less the, the, this last time and time before that. But my wife said to me this time, she said, I'm not going to vote for Trump this time because there will be a war war. She said, oh, that's what she said. And I, I didn't say a word. I said, God, what's going on here? <laughs> she has a different perspective on politics than I do. Okay. All right. Now. He has pain. Okay. Did you know that both of them also have unforgiven sin that needs to be dealt with? Did you know that? And if one of them refuses to deal with their unforgiven sin, it brought it, it creates division. Okay. 
Any questions so far before I go any further? Both of them, because of their past and their pain and their traditions and all that, are going to bring into this marriage blocks. Now you think, well, that's not too bad. It's down there. You know, you'd have to really aim low to hit that wall, right? But that's not what happens. Because a man and a woman think that marriage just sort of happens if you love each other enough, then these things will automatically resolve. But they don't. They don't. What occurs... You just make it us. <laughs> You're right, I didn't. I didn't make it wide enough <laughs> either. So this wall is made. Guess what bounces off that wall? The emotional oneness that was there before you got married. The emotional oneness. I can't tell you the number of women who have come to me over the last 30 years who have said to me, I just don't love the horses behind anymore. Mm -hmm. I just don't love them. The feelings are gone. And me being a good pastor says, no, that's not true. You are angry and hurt and unforgiving and you cannot receive what is being given to you because you cannot and do not and has not been trained to learn how to live in a repentive relationship with your spouse. Couples are not honest with each other. Why aren't couples honest with each other? Because they're afraid of rejection. It's the fear of rejection is what? A stronghold. Fear of rejection, if it's not dealt with, will become bigger and bigger, and it will cause what? Division in relationships. And if you're young, married in the back, don't forget that. Because it will happen. I cannot tell you the number of pastors I went to school with that them and their wives got mad at each other and either got a divorce or left and went home and quit the ministry because they did not understand this biblical principle. It's a biblical, it is not a psychological principle, it's a biblical principle. Okay? You with me? Then how in the world you're supposed to ask Sunni, how do you get rid of the wall? How do you get rid of the wall? Well, no. Why do you ask? <laughs> <laughs> I would practice this <laughs> The greatest relationship skill God gives mankind was demonstrated by Jesus Christ mm -hmm. on the cross. And Jesus said, forgive one another even as I have forgiven you. It is, going to write this on this paper, forgiveness is an act of the will out of obedience to Jesus Christ in his death and resurrection. Forgiveness is an act of the will Because Jesus Christ died and rose again. Whether she or he is right or wrong in this block right here. Doesn't matter if they're right or wrong. You still have to forgive. Were you right or wrong when Jesus forgave you? He gave his heart to you. You gave your heart to him. And he didn't say, nah, you were just right right there. I'm not going to forgive. No, he did not. 
He said, I forgive you. I cleanse you. I begin the healing in you. I give you my Holy Spirit so that you can have life. Okay? You understand that? Do you, do you understand? Any questions so far? I'm not done here. Yet. Hi, Bo. Hey. <laughs> Do you know how to forgive? You may know how to forgive your pastor and other people, but do you know how to forgive your spouse? When was the last time you said to Jesus, I forgive Jeannie in Jesus' name? That's my wife. <laughs> Who said they never said that? Well, good. Oh, praise God. <laughs> I forgive Jeannie in do you realize that forgiveness is so strong? It is so strong that it can wipe out that entire wall if you work at it daily. Because Jesus also said, said forgive seven times 70 in a week, right? He said in a day. For the same sin. For the set thanks. <clears throat> for the same thing. Okay. He said that. How many times would you like Jesus to forgive you with the weakness that you're dealing with in your relationship with him? How many times in a day would you like him to forgive you if you fall hourly? Just hour. That's 24 hours. Mm -hmm. I would like him to do more than seven times seven. Because I'm weak. You, fo you follow what we're talking about? So all of this stuff is going to build this wall. Okay. <laughs> Was that you? The concert begins at nine. <laughs> okay. Now I want you to look at this, remember this, because we're going to go to this sheet right here. <laughs> Is it going to? Everybody <laughs> I was just turning it off. <laughs> That was the bell mark. <laughs> Do you see that? See that mark right there? Guess what that mark is? Yeah. And guess who the mark is between? The husband and the wife. You see that? So in a Christian marriage, don't define that in your definition. You understand? Don't define it in your in a Christian marriage where two people claim that they know Jesus Christ, there are always divisions. There is never complete harmony between people. Okay. There's never complete harmony. And so when when a person gets married, they must be equipped with an understanding of how the relationship and forgiveness skill works in that marriage. You must, and if, and if, and if you don't understand it, then you are going to introduce into your marriage, just your marriage, not your personal life with and relationship with God. You're going to introduce many strongholds that will prevent you from going to God in prayer for your spouse. Bitterness and unforgiveness creates a wall of division. 52%, remember, of all people in your church will get a divorce. 52%.
52%. That's amazing. Don't you think? Used to, used to, in church, it was like 30%. It isn't anymore. What happened to the church? We let the world, the flesh, and the devil work. To our, not to church, our relationships. Okay. I'll give you an example. My wife and I, I was just a young man going to church or church. I went there too. And I was going to school and I was taking theology. I had, I don't know how many um, books of the Bible. I studied just about every book in the, every book in the New Testament. And I was going through the Old Testament and, and I was gathering this knowledge and every now and then it, a friend would come over and we'd discuss what we're learning and how it's the application and all of it. And my wife came to me who knew the Lord before I did. She was a lovely Christian before I ever met her. I didn't even know what that was. She said, Mike, I'm a Christian. I said, what's that? Oh, that doesn't matter. I'm not prejudiced. What I said to <laughs> And about four weeks later, I gave my heart to the Lord and she was praying for me and never shared the gospel with me. Don't tell me that people's prayers don't have authority. Okay. And she said to me, she said, Mike, I don't know how to handle this. And I said, what? Honey? She said, you're growing beyond me. And I knew Christ years before you did. How can I handle that? And I was wise. And I thought about everything I've learned. And I said, I don't know. <laughs> Let's pray together. <clears throat> Let's ask Jesus what to do. So as we pray together, the Lord confirmed in both of our hearts at separate times that she should audit Bible classes. And the professor said to me and to her both, she's the finest Bible student I've ever had. <laughs> and she always got 105 or plus on her grades. And I said, I feel inferior. <laughs> That's only a small thing. Oh, by the way, guess what? Guess what? Remember down here, these guess what else you're different in? Events. Huh? Events. Events. How about raising children? <laughs> <laughs> There's differences there. Unless you came from the same uh, Mennonite group of people in Maryland. Unless you, but that, that, that's the truth. They raise their children the same. So in marriage, that two people confess Christ, the husband has a relationship with God, and he seeks God independently, apart from him. Seek the Lord with all the heart, soul, mind, and strength. We're supposed to do that. He says that, he doesn't say, men and women, seek the Lord with all your heart together. He doesn't say that. Did you know that? Look at the scripture. Then the wife is supposed to seek God independently. Who's the greater teacher? What's it, who's the greatest teacher of all truth? God through the Holy Spirit, right? Mm -hmm. He is the beginning and ending of all knowledge and truth. Okay? So if the, both people are in their hearts sincerely seeking God, then there's going to be growth in both of them. Okay. Does God like his children to live in unforgiveness and sin? Anybody want to answer that? Does he? No. So if you were a parent of a child living in sin, would you want them to live in sin? No. So, so you would, as God leads you to tell your children that what they're doing is wrong, right? So if I am loving my father and, and she is loving her father, then what is Jesus going to speak to them about or God the Father? 
He's going to speak to them about what's going on him here in this wall. Remember, this this wall here. here. That wall. Do you realize how messy that wall is? Do you understand how intertwined it is and how misunderstandings happen? And how when we try and fix it and, and make it sense to us that we're making it worse sense to our spouse? So, so then what do we do? We go to the Father about the wall. Lord, did you see that man I married? You guys don't pray like that. <laughs> did you see... Do you see what he said to me? What he did to me? Do you see how she treated me? But what we do is we just get mad at them because they hurt our feelings. And that's not forgiveness. What you're doing is you're holding more and more grudges and you're building up a hit list in your back pocket. And the next time you deal with the situation in that wall, you bring the hit list and say, I have evidence that you're this, 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 and this. And then you say things out of anger and unforgiveness and bitterness, and the wall gets wider and taller. And you add to it. But if you are independently seeking Christ and praying that God's authority will rest in your marriage, then he will speak to the issues that are here. And if you really, this, this is really complicated, so listen closely. If you really want God to be in the middle of your marriage, he will resolve all these things if you both are truly seeking God. Do you hear me? <laughs> we live in a very self-centered society. And women have an image of what marriage is supposed to be like. If you're just newly married to back, listen close. <laughs> Women have a view of what marriage is supposed to be like. I'm, I'm picking on you, Mason. Will you forgive me? <laughs> and men have an image of what uh, marriage is going to be like. When I got married, my image of my... my uh, Please, I don't want to offend anybody, but when I got married, I was well, really I, old, so it's okay. Good. I mean, <laughs> but just a little older, it'd be better. I thought that I was getting married to one of the most beautiful women, and I was able to go to bed with her and eat all the food that she caught, and I just couldn't wait. Cook. Cook. So, so I that was my image, and then I could go and play softball I wanted and basketball. I played industrial softball, I played industrial basketball, and we had great teams because I was on it and I was so happy. And and one day she comes to me and she says, I'm lonely. I said, I don't understand. I'm really happy. <laughs> Who was self-centered? Me. <laughs> I was self-centered. I still didn't see it. There's this wall. She doesn't care to talk to me anymore. And she says, go somewhere and get something to eat. Your mother will fix it. You'll like it better. This kind of stuff started going on, okay? But I was seeking, what was that? Yeah, you ain't seen nothing. <laughs> She's a godly woman. So I'm seeking God, and I'm going to God because I love the Lord. And I said, Lord, I love this woman. And I, I work, and, and I make sure we have a place to live. And I, I got her car, and she's safe and secure. And I'm giving him all the reasons why I'm such a good guy. Self-centeredness. Mm -hmm. And he turns around, and he says, you're a very selfish young man. Mm -hmm. I said, no, I'm not God. <laughs> I, you're not that honest with God. I am. 
Why? He died for me. He died for me. And guess what? Guess what? I finally had to say, okay, Lord. All right. I've sinned. But I did not know what to do. I hadn't read all the books that Dobson wrote or Chuck Swinsall wrote. I didn't, I hadn't read all those books. I didn't even know they were printed at that time in my life. Um, I, I said, I don't know what to do. My wife was getting farther and farther away emotionally from me. God had called me into the ministry, a self-centered man into the ministry. And I said, what should I do? He said, go to her and ask her to do what? Cook cheeseburgers? <laughs> to forgive me. And ask her what else she needs me to forgive her for. And she gave me a list of things, which we won't talk about right now. And then she said, and you turn your socks Wrong side out when you put them in the wash. <laughs> that is so annoying. <laughs> and I said, well, then what am I supposed to do? I didn't, I didn't wash. She washed the clothes. My mother washed my clothes. And she told me. And then I go back and seek God some more. And he comes back to me and he says, every time you come into the house, you go find her wherever she's at and you ask her how she's doing and you give her a kiss on the forehead. And he also told me, don't be surprised that she does not want it because she's angry. <coughs> so I start and at first, you ever know what cold shoulder is? That's what it is <laughs> when your wife does it. And, and I say, should I continue? He said, do it. Over time, it was less like this. And, and then after a while, she'd go like this. <laughs> Seeking God in your marriage relationship. You're, you're ministering to people. And they're having trouble. You need to ask people how their relationship with God is and how their relationship is with their spouse. And if they do not, if things aren't healthy, you deal with the spiritual relationship with God first. And then you deal with the relationship with the spouse. Then he told me that I needed to be humble before my wife. And he said, when, when you, when I tell you or she tells you that you've been offensive to her in any way, you need to ask her to forgive you. Do you understand that I, I played high school athletics and I was in the top 10% of the state of West Virginia? I know that doesn't mean anything. <laughs> and there was nobody that got in my way. And now I have to say to my wife, will you forgive me? for being rude. Do you know how hard it is for a man to recognize he's rude? Tough. But God began to say that. Mike, you're rude. Mm -hmm. And I began to ask her to forgive me. Good training. Good. <laughs> and she would say, it's okay. It's okay. Yes, I forgive you. Do you know what happens when you ask your wife or husband to forgive you when God tells you to? The Holy Spirit begins to work on you. And the relationship is becoming spiritual in nature, not food-centered and not sex-centered, but it's becoming spiritual because the goal of marriage is to establish the institution that God established in Genesis chapter 3. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. If you do not do that, the best that you know how, we're not perfect, the best that you know how, God will, if you don't do it, strongholds develop between each other. That 
heaven heaven knows about the strongholds that are already internal in you, okay? Like the occult or abuse or neglect, all of that stuff. Who is so you've got all of that on top of your inability to have a forgiving relationship with your spouse. So we were this went on, I don't know how long it went on. It might have been a year, it might have been six months, and she finally looked at me and she said, Quit it. Don't ask me to forgive you again. I said, I said, is it okay if God tells me to ask you to forgive me? She was, I guess so. She loved God. My wife loves God. Always has loved God. The only Christian that we know of in her family. Her brother gave his heart to him. But she, she's the only Christian that we know of. Loves the Lord very much. Why is this important? First of all, you give glory to God. See that? And not yourself, but to God. The second thing is you create an atmosphere right here in this relationship because all three of you are involved in the relationship with Jesus Christ. And where are children raised? The kids go right here. And they become witnesses to what God says in the book of Genesis before the fall is the most powerful presence of Jesus Christ in all the Bible. Hey, we're broken people. I was a broken person. I'm still being mended. Okay? I'm still being mended. This is not what I taught. What is it? This could be okay. <laughs> Kids. And if I didn't go to these triangles. Okay, let's say the, the wife is growing and the, the husband is over here hiding in the hole somewhere. He says he doesn't believe in God, but what he's doing is he's hiding from God so God won't tell him what to do. That's what men do. You know that, mm -hmm. don't you? You guys don't know that? You haven't kids? I used to go to the softball field all the time and hide from my wife. You guys didn't do stuff like that? Or go play golf and hide from your wife? Or fix your tractor? <laughs> Honey, what are you doing? I'm fixing my tractor. Leave me alone. <laughs> That's a husband hiding. Okay? She's growing. Now, Women come to me and say, what am I going to do with my husband because he does not want to follow God and there's this big wall between us? You seek God. Ladies, seek God. If you continue to seek God, he will put your relationship in perspective with him and God will automatically, you do not have to Become the junior Holy Spirit on this man. You do not. You know what the junior Holy Spirit is? <laughs> Telling him all of his sins and weaknesses and how he needs to repent. You don't have to do that. Why? Because God wants him saved more than you do. And you can even have an atmosphere in Christ. Right there. Where the kids grow up. And God will begin to address all these issues down here. Why? You are given authority in Christ because of his death and resurrection. Luke chapter 10, verse 18 and 19, over all the power of the enemy. Okay. <clears throat> and I guarantee you one thing. He will do everything in the divine, holy, powerful name of God to redeem this man. Okay? He will do that. Guess it's the same way over here, man. There are some men and wearing women, and, and they're just so beautiful, and they just overwhelm them with their beauty and grace and kindness and their cherry pie and all of that stuff they get right down to them and they marry them but they really oh yeah i believe in jesus a little bit 
For I believe that way. This is why Jesus says don't be unequally yoked because of the, the, the spiritual effort that it takes to bring Christ to bear upon that situation. And then you find out that your wife is really indifferent about God. Same thing. You seek God. God will deal with the things that separate you, and he will convict her. Okay? Questions. No question. You've not been married yet. So. Um, you and I talked a little bit about this today. The, the idea of, you know, repentance and the difference between, um, will you forgive me? I'm going to do it again. I'm not going to change my behavior, but will you forgive me? And I'm going to do the same exact thing tomorrow. Like, she actually tells that you, to you? No, I say this. Oh, you're me. saying I'm going to do it tomorrow to you? <laughs> That's interesting. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> he wants to know that about, uh, he said that when you ask somebody to forgive you and you're just going to go ahead and do it tomorrow, how does that work? Well, and the idea of, you know, maybe it's back to the 770, the, the it's that's if I come to my wife and I say I'm repentant and what can I do differently, you know, and I want to turn this around, that's one thing. But if it's a persistent and it's like, I, you know, I'm really not intending to change my behavior, mm -hmm. then, then do you think God knows that? Yeah, okay, of course He does. Does do you think your wife knows that? So so her job then, take notes for her. <laughs> Your, her job will be to send his Holy Spirit. God, you know why my husband does that, pokes me in the eye. You know, you know the reasons and the motive behind it. And you know how she will pray. You know how this hurts me. I forgive this man, in Jesus' name, send your Holy Spirit and bear the greatest, if need be, persecution on him until you have his attention and he repents. And if you're serious about that, you need to go to your wife and tell her that because she needs to pray for you. Okay? I'm going to be dealing with the forgiveness cycle, but not tonight. It takes too long. And I, and I, uh, do you know, do you know that people who, uh, who have been sexually molested? I had a lady, and you've heard me tell the story for, for forgive me, Sam. I had a lady come to me and, and she told her mother told her that the day she took her home to her, to her father's house, which she was required to do, that he molested her that first day and molested her every day until she was 45 when he died. She said, how can I forgive him? And I taught her that every time you feel the pain of the sin and acted upon you, and you ask Jesus to forgive that man in Jesus' name and to heal you and fill you with your Holy Spirit, I said, there will come a time where the pain will be gone and you will even be able to pray for him even though he's already died. She goes, no, you don't know what he did. I said, I have no idea what he did to you. I said, looking at you and what you've done and what's been going on in your life, it must have been horrendous or worse. And she said it was. I remember the day she came into my office, it was... It was a couple of years. It wasn't overnight. She came in and she had tears in her eyes. And she said, this is the first time I ever had love from my grandfather. Mm -hmm. Jesus has healed the pain in my life. Mm -hmm. God can, he can bring you under control and he can heal the pain in your life. 
if that's what's going on. You understand what I'm saying? And we'll talk about that forgiveness cycle. It was through her that God showed me that. That mm-hmm. cycle. God bless her heart. Good question. I didn't quite answer. We will another time. Okay. Someone else. You all could smile a little bit. Too. It's really nice to be here. Someone else. Yeah. How would you advise a husband or wife that feels to have a biblical reason for leaving their spouse? But now what's that? How would you advise a husband or wife that feels they have a biblical reason that the spouse has been unfaithful um, to separate or to leave? Ah, you want to answer that question? Yeah. Great question. <laughs> I would say, I would put them, I would ask them and teach them how to forgive. And I, I would say, it's not your opinion, but this must be something that is God directed and not because of your emotions. And so that means that that person will have to deal with the emotional pain due to the marriage relationship and give it to the Lord over and over again until he heals it. And your emotions are out of the way as much as they're able so that you can go to God and you say to God, Lord God, this is the circumstances. Should I leave this person? And then I would encourage them to be separated first, as the scripture says, for a while and see what happens after that. Does that help? I mean, there needs to be an intense examination. If I'm going to do something like break a covenant, I have got to examine before the Lord my heart and ask for healing for what's going on inside of me. Does that make sense? He wanted to know how I would advise somebody if they came and they said they had a biblical reason for divorcing somebody, and I just explained that, you all heard it. So, good question. Someone else? Can any marriage be saved? Oh, good question. No, not every marriage can be saved. When there's criminal acts involved, when horrendous, ungodly behavior is involved, like uh, a man wants to sell his wife in prostitution to one of his friends. You understand how bad that is? That man broke that covenant. You you understand? He broke it. Wonderful question, whoever asked that. Somebody else. Another point that my wife and I made a decision when we were first married. I was very young in the Lord when we got married. Very young. I mean, we got married. She was 18 and I was 19. And I'd only known the Lord for a year. Okay, I dated, we dated for two years. I only know the Lord for a year, year and a half. I can't remember. If she was here, she'd tell you. She could tell you the first day we had our date, first date. And it was May 18th, my mother's birthday. I think that's what it was. She, could, she knows all that stuff. But when we, when we got married, we had a brief talk. It was not long drawn out. It was not biblical or theological in nature. You know, that's the thing that everything's got to be biblical and theological. No, it needs to be down to earth before the Lord and honest with one another. Okay. And, and, and I said, I don't want us to ever consider divorce. And she said, I agree. And then we had a brief prayer. But the conversation was maybe 10 minutes long. We didn't discuss why we get a divorce. We just made a commitment to God. And that doesn't happen. Do you know people are getting married in the church now who already have an escape plan? Did you know that? God bless those people who through adversity commit to the covenant relationship 
God bless you. I mean, it's hard. The hardest thing in, in the world is not our economy and not what's going on in Taiwan. The hardest thing is to remain faithful to the covenant in marriage. Because there's so many things that... Uh, Amen. Amen. Did they is the prenup considered an escape route? Yes. Say that she wants to know if the prenup is an escape for a rate or a an escape for a way out. For a way out. Whatever you said. Escape route, she said. And I said, Yes, it is. It is an escape route. If you don't love your spouse enough and you don't know that they love know the lord enough and you got all this money and property and you're scared to death they're going to take it do not get married period a friend of mine that she married this guy that had a ton of money and every year that she stayed with him she would get more money when they got divorced <laughs> when they got divorced <sighs> If they got divorced, and obviously they got divorced. <laughs> <laughs> that is one of the most hilarious stories. She, she said for you on Zoom, she said she had a friend who married somebody with whole lots of money, and there was a prenup that said every year that they stayed together, when they got a divorce, she'd get more money. That's terrible, isn't it? And then they got a divorce. Is it time already? Yeah. Okay, we're going to stop and we'll come back and we'll take the, the second class. Let me pray. Father, bless these people. Uh, I'm long-winded tonight, uh, but these people have very good listening skills. Just bless them in Jesus' name. Amen.